Good. So maybe, maybe we'll start um, just giving a little bit of an introduction uh, as, as people are joining. Um, so we have a lot, lot to cover today. So we don't want to lose any time. So welcome to today's webinar. Um, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, this webinar is titled Going from Decentralized to Centralized Global Payroll. Um, my name is Mark Oliver Fiedler. I'm founder and CEO of Pazar, and I'm going to be facilitating the ses session today. Uh, I'm excited to be joined by uh, a number of fantastic panelists um, that have agreed to spend some time with us today. Uh, first off, Celine Caballé. Um, she is Global HR Director at Fagron, which is a pharmaceutical company that's present in over 20, 25 countries um, with about 4,000 4, or so employees. Um, then we also have Doug Allard uh, on the call with us. Uh, Doug is a financial, finance systems and projects executive at Sidesavers, which is a, an NGO that is globally active. Um, and then we have our very own Ramses Valencia, uh, and Ramses heads up our implementation team here at Pazar. So um, a couple just quick housekeeping items before we uh, start talking a bit about the topic for today. Um, all of the lines uh, of the attendees are placed on mute. If you do want to ask a question, please use the Q&A uh, function that you see at the bottom of your screen. You can type in question or comment or message there and uh, we'll pick them up as we go along. We will also keep a bit of time at the end um, of the, uh, the session for questions um, to the panelists or to any of us on the call. Um, this whole webinar is also being recorded uh, and we will share the recording over the next, uh, over the next few days as well, okay? So um, the topic for today, I think, is a topic that um, we're, you know, encountering a lot as, as we're traveling and meeting uh, different organizations around the world. Um, the, the topic of how to move from a decentralized payroll structure to a centralized payroll structure uh, keeps coming up a lot. And, Typically, when we when we look at organizations that are global, um, when we take a closer look at how payroll is organized, payroll tends to be still quite um, fragmented in most organizations, meaning uh, different local payroll providers, different local payroll systems, different local payroll processes, different data sets, uh, and that and that creates obviously a lot of um, complexity um, and, and on top of that, lots of work that ends up still being done manually. Um, so the big question then is, you know, how do you turn this sort of wild landscape of, you know, heterogeneous different local payroll solutions <clears throat> into something that starts to look cohesive, that uh, becomes more standardized, homogenized, and is easier to manage, uh, brings you economies of scale, uh, and uh, allows you to introduce smart um, technology and you know uh, productivity capabilities that allow you to manage your payroll environment better. So um, that's what we're going to talk be talking about today. The way uh, we have structured the webinar is we're going to start off with a little bit of a, a panel discussions um, with Celine and Doug. Um, I'm going to be asking them some questions about their own experience as they've gone through uh, uh, their own experience of moving from a decentralized to a centralized payroll structure. Um, and, uh, and then at the end, after we're done with the panel discussion, uh, we'll hand it over to Ramses, who's gonna give us a quick demo and show some of the tools that um, are available and that you can use in order to help you make that transformation easier to move from decentralized to a global uh, structure, okay? So with that being said, let's jump right in. Um, so Celine, Doug, welcome. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Um, let's start by hearing a little bit from both of you. Uh, what did the global payroll landscape look like at Fagron and at Sightsavers 
uh, when you started to think about and look at how to reshape the payroll environment at your respective organizations? Uh, maybe sorry, Celine, sorry. if you are sorry, <laughs> I was going to ask Celine to, to maybe start ladies first and then we'll move to Doug. Well, um, so to give you a bit of a background, so we are organized in three regions, uh, three areas. So EMEA, North America um, and South America. We're in total 20 countries. And uh, in the past years, we have been working a lot in centralizing payroll per country. Uh, so for the United States, we have multiple companies centralizing in the United States, same for the Netherlands, etc. cetera. Um, but apart from that, uh, we, were, we were decentralized. So organized per country, uh, and we didn't have any kind of uh, global overview, global reporting or whatsoever. Um, so that, that's where we started from. Okay. And, and, and what were some of the challenges then that started to make you think about maybe you need to do something differently from that, um, from that very decentralized structure that you, you, you set off with? Well, we are, we are a company uh, with a very active buy and build strategy. So we also acquire new companies um, more than one in, once a year. And so you, you keep on adding new systems. Um, and um, we were missing kind of control, um, control over risk. Uh, but at the same time, we were also yeah facing issues in terms of for example, reporting, we don't have a global uh, view on, for example, yeah, the, the salaries, the, the, neither on the process in the different countries. Um, and as, for example, topics uh, as diversity and inclusion is uh, becoming more and more important to us. Um, we, we actually don't have any kind of way to do a reporting or an analysis on, for example, pay gaps. Um, so we were facing a lot of challenges um, of this, this uh, decentralized uh, situation. Perfect. Okay, understood. Um, so Doug, curious to hear your your uh, picture. Of, you know what 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 was the situation like at Sightsavers? Yeah. So I was um, essentially brought into Sightsavers to manage this centralization operation. So when I uh, joined, which was uh, around about a year ago now. Uh, the first thing I did was kind of assess the situation, and it's it's a lot um, of what Selena's describing there. Um, everything very disparate. Um, so essentially, the the issues that we encountered are, um, you know, there's uh, information asymmetry. Um, there's, uh, you know, the central HR department not necessarily being completely abreast of everything that's going on in every location uh, in a in a timely way. Um, so that was one of the first things that really needed a solution. Um, I also kind of identified that there wasn't a very robust um, system in place for like business continuity, you know, in the event of something going wrong, how does the process get picked up and continue, uh, say, in the absence of a, of a key employee or something like that. Um, and obviously in investigating, you know, all of the processes across the board, um, we found obviously a lot of manual work that's been going on that could be automated. And um, we found, uh, you know, employees performing tasks that they'd essentially inherited uh, from you know, someone before them and they didn't necessarily understand the purpose, um, a lot of which was um, you know, quite unnecessary and definitely, you know, improvable. Um, so, yeah, that's where, that's where we started from. And in your respective organizations, was there already a defined um, kind of function or role department for payroll that kind of was sitting at a global level or did that not even exist yet when you started that, um, that whole process? At Flagron, we, we, we haven't. So it was uh, really organized per country and um, in the smaller countries. So in, in larger countries, we, we do have payroll professionals but in uh, smaller countries, uh, it was either handled by, well, mostly handled by uh, someone in finance. So not with a dedicated payroll function. So yeah, 
I can uh, I can re I, I can refer to what Doc was saying uh, uh, in terms of also of continuity, for example, that was also a risk. Um, yeah. And I think in your case, it was actually in some countries, if I remember, it was finance, but then in other countries, the ownership for payroll um, rolled up under HR as well, right? So it wasn't even yeah. kind of consistently defined from an ownership perspective where payroll is exactly. actually sitting. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And at Sidesavers, uh, Doug, global yeah, payroll defined? We had uh, much the same kind of situation. Um, even now, the, the centralization is an ongoing um, you know, effort uh, where we're currently working on a segment of the, of the global footprint, obviously with the long-term aim to establish the, the complete global view uh, within Paysal. Excellent. So then with that kind of as a starting point, what, what were the biggest um, drivers in your organization to move from decentralized to the opposite, essentially, to a centralized structure, a shared service type of um, setup. Maybe Doug, if you want to start this one. Um, yeah, so I think probably Salim will have a, a similar answer that the, the sort of COVID era changed things for uh, work patterns and remote working. And um, you probably experienced similar things with employees sort of turning up in countries where they weren't expected to be because of the you know, exceptional circumstances of, of the lockdowns and things like that. Um, and so we found that has obviously prompted a lot of demand for remote working, you know, in other countries where there aren't isn't necessarily a, uh, you know, established presence. So that has basically led to the need to add more country payrolls um, to the footprint. And then, you know, that kind of stacks complexity um, to a point where it becomes, uh, you know, necessary to, to revisit wholesale the the approach to the uh, global payroll. Um, another thing that uh, I would highlight is um, some people will probably have experience of when you're managing supplier relationships with payroll providers in lots of different countries, you find there is quite a uh, varied sort of approach to data security and data protection. And so one of the key things that we wanted to do was, um, you know, make that a uniform um, standard uh, sort of level of security for obviously protecting sensitive information and, and transferring it uh, with our ICPs. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I, we've seen that a lot that I think the uh, first point you mentioned COVID as an accelerator for um, globalization in general and then, you know, complexity, un, unanticipated, I suppose, complexity on the, uh, on the, on the payroll side um, that drives the need for you know, just figuring out how do you handle so many, you know, employees across so many different countries. Celine, in your case, um, what, what were some of the drivers at Fagron for centralizing? So next to risk and control, what I mentioned, and also uh, the need for reporting, for example, um, efficiency and cost were also very important drivers. Um, um, so we are looking at centralizing per region. Uh, for North America, it's the most easiest one because it's already, I mean, North America is one country. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's, um, and, um, and Latin America, we're talking about three countries, but EMEA is, is, is for us the biggest challenge because we're talking about 15 countries. And so we are actually um, centralizing both payroll and finance. It's a combined project that run in parallel. We go first. Um, in payroll and then finance will follow uh, and this will allow us to to bring in efficiency to have a shared service center with dedicated payroll people and then also dedicated um, finance uh, professionals um, so we will be able to to bring efficiency across and so all over uh, these 15 countries and at the same time by uh, essentially bringing everything to one shared service center we will be uh, we will be um, having cost savings uh, ultimately. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so that was uh, an important element of the business case as well. And it's interesting to hear that in your case, it, it, it's not just payroll that's moving into a shared service structure. It's a broader, it's a broader corporate um, initiative or drive to, you mentioned finance and maybe even other functions that are kind of 
going through a similar transformation, right? Yes, yes. And um, as we are, as in many countries, payroll is being done by finance professionals. And as we are also going to uh, centralize finance, so accounts uh, payables, accounts receivables, um, those two go hand in hand. And we're bringing both to uh, uh, our shared service center in Barcelona. Right. Um, and so have both finance and payroll uh, done from there. Okay. So talk, talking about um, you know, different functions, obviously moving to a set more centralized structure, that service structure is not unique, um, a unique undertaking just for payroll. Lots of other functions are doing the same. Um, in some organizations, they might have already done it, and other organizations, like you're describing, payroll's kind of going first, and then other functions are, are following. Um, but I'm curious from, from what you're experiencing, what you've seen, do you think it's harder or easier for? payroll function to be centralized compared to let's say like you're you're obviously responsible for all of hr within fagron celine so if you're thinking about the centralization of other parts of your uh functional portfolio do you think payroll is is trickier to to centralize or um how, how would you compare that to other functions they're going through i i do believe so i'm not sure i mean i, I um it's difficult to to judge and to tell for other functions but um we have some complexity due to one is language um and secondly and because i mean um employees um in all those different countries they, they don't all speak english so you we will have to do with the, these different languages, um, but mainly different rules and regulations. Uh, so in terms of comp and ban, so all these, um, it brings some complexity be because of this scattered um, yeah, landscape, payroll landscape, uh, due to the fact that you have in each and every country different regulations, uh, different types of comp and ban elements, etc. So that of course yeah. in finance you also have different tax regulations etc so but i i from my perspective it's more complex okay and, yeah and there's actually a, um a question kind of along the similar lines uh coming coming through the, the qa um which is asking about how you reflect various different company agreements um that need to be reflected in payroll for each legal entity. Um, and I think what this is sort of asking about is in a way what you touched on just now, Celine, that um, in payroll, of course, there's some very specific local regulatory and legislative aspects that need to be still um, managed and ad adhered to. And um, you can't just centralize, you know, the, the local obligations away um, that you have with you know, local tax office, social security, workers' councils, and so on. So um, I guess what I'm hearing you say is that you need to pay close attention to which parts of the port payroll activity scope you're, you're truly centralizing for which parts you still need to maintain that kind of local expertise, right? Yeah, so th that's why we also chose for a phased approach country by country and then mm -hmm. at each time you can take take into account the country specifics and 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 tackle them uh country by country yeah, yeah. doug any views from your side uh a on kind of the the challenge that maybe is unique to payroll in terms of centralizing and also the question that's being asked about you know how do you make sure you still reflect the the very specific local uh, legisl legislative or regulatory dimensions of payroll? Uh, yeah, so I haven't really managed you know, centralization of, of any other um, sort of business aspects, so I, I can't necessarily speak to that. But the one thing I would say about um, the PAYSAR approach is that uh, because it enables you to keep your uh, in-country supplier relationships, which I'm sure we'll touch on a bit later, um, it's not so much, um, you know, trying to replace the wings on the airplane while it's in the air, um, because you aren't going to necessarily, you aren't going to disrupt the core 
payroll process. You're you're adding tools and you're adding you know things on top of that uh, to make life easier. But you know if something with implementation were to not go so smoothly, you're not going to crash the plane. Um, so I would say you know that's the that's the benefit. The pays our system versus something that's uh, more you know uh, having to replace everything from the ground up. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very, very, very important point is, um, you know, on, 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 on all of this, um, as we're having the discussion centralizing uh, payroll that um, you absolutely still need local expertise, right? You can't, you can't ignore the fact that, you know, payroll and um, in terms of interpreting the laws and, you know, validating your, 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 your payroll calculation have been done correctly still requires um, you know, the local expertise. And so having um, external experts or internal experts that uh, can bring that perspective to, to the table. Um, in many organizations, obviously that sort of you know, uh, deep local knowledge, legislative knowledge, regulatory knowledge is, is outsourced to uh, an external party. Um, so maintaining that local expertise but then standardizing, streamlining, streamlining everything that sort of goes on, on top of that or around that, um, how you communicate information between different stakeholders within the organization, how you manage your, your documents, retain your documents, how you structure your data and, and organize your data, um, and how you bring in uh, tools that can help to automate some of those manual processes that happen you know, quite in, in a very labor intensive fashion at the local level. I think those are all the, the benefits that you get from streamlining and standardizing your payroll operational environment. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a very good point that um, the, uh, uh, the person who was, 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 was asking about that, you know, there's still the local legislation that absolutely needs to be um, paid attention to, needs to be reflected in your setup. Uh, which brings us to, to another uh, part of the discussion is um, overall in that transformation going from decentral to central, what have been um, the biggest challenges that you experienced in that, in that transformation? Yeah, um, so, I, uh, well, and, and also relating to, 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 the, to the previous point, and someone during the process told me uh, global payroll is an illusion the global payroll doesn't exist and you you have to face with all these differences so you try to 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 bring efficiency in everything that you can centralize and that you can globalize but you at the same time you have to deal with with all the local differences um and so that's that's fine in that that balance uh and that made us also um um choose for in certain countries to vendor switch because we have to make sure that um i mean the vendors that we were happy with we kept them but those that we said well they cannot meet um the support they cannot bring the support that we need and to cover all these these differences that that are reality um, for example, uh, we, we had some local vendors that didn't speak English. Well, if you if you if you don't have a contact person in English, uh, I mean that's essential if you work from a from a centralized and uh, from a shared service center. So that made us also um, do some vendor switches. That makes the, the the implementation and the project heavier, but at the same time, it was a must. To uh, to add that to the scope uh, of the of the project. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, your local your local needs change as well, right? And that um, as you're transforming, and so you need to maybe in certain places readjust and recalibrate to the uh, the local setup or the local vendors that you're choosing to work with for sure. Mm -hmm. Doug, in your experience, what what were the biggest what were the hardest things um, to move the organization i mean it's not a it's you know can be uh, a fairly involved process right uh, even just culturally to get the organization to uh, accept and let go of sort of the decentral laissez-faire structure that maybe has grown over a long time and you know um agree to 
work in a more uh, central centralized manner. What was your experience at, at site servers? Yeah, so um, I think one of the, the things we encountered sort of when we were uh, sort of assessing our options for centralizing the, the global payroll was um, some providers' needs for legal entities in different countries. Um, so I have some background in uh, you know global payroll aggregation services, and I, so I happen to know that in some instances uh, it's not necessary to have legal entities in, in a given country. Um, but yeah, we we did find that some providers they want to make things simpler for themselves by sort of imposing that requirement on the client. Um, and so that narrowed down our field of options because you know having uh, a non-resident uh, employer status in a country was basically the option that we needed to pursue in a couple of cases. Uh, and so that was a difficulty. I mean, so once we've selected uh, you know our solution, um, I, I found myself sort of developing quite a polished sales pitch for the Paysar system. Uh, because obviously I had a lot of internal stakeholders to, um, to you know, convey the benefits of this solution to. Um, and, you know, you have uh, people who have been in positions for a long time who don't necessarily like to uh, have change or to relinquish control over certain things. I mean, the great thing about the, the Paysar system is that it's really, really flexible. You can have, you know, any number of users with any number of different privileges and that access rights and things like that. So it was really just a, uh, a challenge of education for the stakeholders to say, that it's not gonna, it's not gonna change, it's still gonna have the same role, you're still gonna be able to view everything here and do everything like this. Um, and obviously explain that, you know, we wanna bring the system in so that we can centralize things for, for these other, you know, numerous benefits yeah. that come with that. Yeah, still get the local flexibility and the local, you know, um uniqueness is covered but benefit from all the things that can be done more efficiently through a central system and a central platform and you know benefit from the the automation that um that that sort of platform environment brings you yeah um any any in your experience um celine anyone who was particularly hard to bring along on this journey from decentralized to centralized. Um, I mean, I'm thinking you always have, as Doug said, lots of different stakeholders to convince, right? There's the local fiefdoms that have sort of operated the way that they've always operated, right? And um, maybe in some cases, they're actually happy to give up paper and say, you take it. Um, I'm curious whether you've experienced that anywhere, but, but also some of the central stakeholders you've got you know, your IT organization, you've got finance. Um, was it hard to convince the different stakeholders to make that switch or did you run in open doors? Actually, that that went pretty well. Uh, and because of the, uh, we, we decided to choose uh, for the for the for the PSR platform. So we chose for platform provider, which is a much lighter implementation than if you would do a, a global ven a global payroll vendor switch. That would be a very heavy um, implementation with vendor switches in each country countries, and that would uh, require much more change management because uh, local companies would have to give up their their system uh, and being replaced by. A system that is imposed by 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 global by headquarters, and then you get some kind of resistance. So, um, but this is more light, so they could keep on working with their with their own vendors. And we were just we're just adding an extra layer, and that makes it much easier to um, yeah just to implement, but also to get the buy in of of all all, all stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But a layer that um, is not sort of a, okay, gee, now I have to work in yet another set of tools, right? It's, it's, it's a layer that sort of um, replaces some of the things that otherwise people would have been doing locally in their sort of decentralized local tools. So now it gives you kind of a consistent uh, technology layer that everyone works in, right? I just want to clarify that. Uh, so it doesn't, doesn't get understood that, oh, gee, now I have, you know, too many different layers that I'm going to be having to deal with. Um, no, yeah, correct. Uh, so so um, 
I guess talking about that, I'm, I'm we're already kind of touching on, on the technology aspect of transformation quite a bit here. Um, and I'm wondering from both of your experience, how important or what role did the technology play in this whole transformation process? Doug, do you want to start on this one? Sure. Um, so, I mean, we're basically, you know, we're well into the implementation process and we're still finding new use cases across the company for people coming to me saying, I have this thing that I have to do every month. Um, can it be done better? And, you know, with Paysar, we've actually found a lot of instances where we can save everyone a lot of time because that's really the whole, uh, you know, point of the technology aspect is uh, automation and, and time cost savings, basically. Um, so we've been really pleased on that. I think um, the people ideally want to, you know, automate to a really extreme level um, and probably, uh, you know, it should be made clear that Paysar is not like a panacea of set it and forget it and, it and it just runs all by itself. But what it does give you is a lot of cut down of manual processes and a high degree of control um, so that basically, um, you know, you've got loads of flexibility and you've got the ability to fix any issues or add any requirements um, that you actually come across as, as you meet them, which is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, great to hear. Uh, Celine, in your, in your, um, from your perspective, how important was the technology dimension of you know, setting up your shared service structure? Because you could do a shared service without you know, too much technology being being introduced into that uh, into that new environment. But in your case, you obviously decided to roll a new. It couldn't have been possible. Yeah, it couldn't have been possible without. I mean, technology was a base. We first look into the technology. How can we harmonize? And and what what is this? What can be the supporting tool and to harmonize and to allow us to to um, to have a unified, centralized approach. Uh, because that will be the prerequisite in order to build that shared service center. Without, without the right technology, we, we wouldn't have been able to, to set up a shared service center in payroll um, whatsoever. So, uh, okay. yeah. Okay. So it's front and center, essentially. Um, technology yes. needs to go hand in hand with that organizational transformation that, that, that you're implementing. Yeah, because we're talking about 20 countries and at the same time we're talking about even more different uh, local payroll providers because uh, we have more or less 60 companies. So yeah. uh, you have to start from harmonizing your processes and working starting from one, one technology uh, right. as a base for, 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 um, for that. Yeah. yeah. I think what we sometimes see is that it, it helps when you have a technology platform that in a way becomes a forcing function for creating these standardized processes, right? Um, because I've, I've seen it in, in past experiences where companies try to create a shared service structure or you know, bring processes closer together uh, without the technology. And um, you know, what, while that can yield certain benefits, um, I think you you still run the risk that each each uh, local payroll operations team still brings sort of its own unique aspects into into that environment. And by having kind of that global technology platform, it really starts to uh, you know bring that template across everyone that everyone mm -hmm. sort of starts to align around. Um, now you, you you both you know obviously decided to work with with Paysar as your global payroll solution, but um, uh, clearly you also looked at other options um, in the market. And I'm I'm not looking for for any you know calling out any names or any specific you know vendors, but I'm curious in terms of thinking about different choices. What were your Thoughts. What were your considerations, and how did you end up making the decision that you um, you arrived at? Doug, do you want to start? Uh, yeah. So, um, obviously, with global payroll, there is it's like a question of degree of outsourcing, really, um, and how much uh, of the payroll process you can keep in house or have to pay someone else to do. 
So a lot of it, I think, depends on your sort of resources internally. I mean, as we've discussed, you're always going to have to outsource the HR, the legal um, ad advice elements um, of, of each country. You don't have a choice there. Um, but if you have some internal resources, you know, if your company is good at supplier management and uh, systems administration and payments processing, um, then really there isn't that much benefit to you going with a, a big global aggregator um, because you're not going to have to do those those latter things. But you may not actually necessarily get the uh, the prior things either um, because the global aggregators they're going to outsource that stuff themselves. So do you really want to take on their overhead, um, or do you want to just maintain your direct relationship with your own country provider for your HR legal needs? Um, so in our case, it was an assessment of what is the organization's strengths. Um, and, you know, we have very robust supply management and, and treasury procedures as, a, as an NGO. So it didn't make sense to pay a lot of money for a, you know, one-on-one -on -one payment solution that wasn't even going to be a great fit, wasn't going to really have any advantage to us. Um, so pays are really stuck out as a really flexible option where we could keep our strengths in-house. Um, and keep our, our outsourcing um, to basically as direct and, and low cost as option an option as possible. Okay. So flexibility of working with you know the the right local vendors that fit your specific needs and having very direct relationships and control over those vendor relationships is an important yeah, exactly. aspect. Of yeah. Okay. Uh, Celine, for you for you guys at Fabron. Yeah, we um, we have looked at uh, global payroll providers, uh, aggregators, um, and platform providers, and um, we I must say from the, in the beginning uh, we were like, yeah, let's also look at at platform providers, but it was like like not the first the initial thought that we would end up with that, um, but then um, yeah, looking. At global payroll providers, you, it, it's it's a heavy implementation. It would increase uh, costs for local uh, uh, local companies because they would have to to switch to to um, um, like like Doc just said. Eh, you have some good, well performing local payroll providers, and you would have to give up on them. Um, we also um, saw that not many aggregators are able to cover all countries so um, and some sometimes yeah so you're also stuck in, in, in that geographical scope um, and I must say during the RFP that we have done I was um, yeah very pleasantly surprised by by the solution that that you were able to offer uh, it was like whoa yes um, uh, it, it really surprised me and I was uh, very um, um, I, I see this as a future. Of, I, I think you mentioned Mark during one of our conversations. It, it, I think it's kind of um, uh, changing the landscape of payroll. Uh, I think this is disruptive and 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 it, it's so simple and easy. Um, so um, no, I'm 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 still very glad that we made that choice. Um, and I think um, it helps you to achieve your. Uh, goals and your objectives of a centralized payroll, of having this risk, uh, this this control, having these reporting capabilities, etc. So you you can you can tick all the boxes of your objectives, but at the same time, it's much lighter and simpler in and flexible um, than moving all companies to one global aggregator. Um, where you would have to make a lot of compromises. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, just, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Doug. Yeah. I was just like to add that when you when you say that this is kind of like the future of, of global payroll, that's very much the way I feel. And having worked in a, a payroll aggregator company before, I looked at the system and thought, well, yeah, so that automates my role, my old role. Don't need that anymore. Um, obviously the the tools and the usability. Um, the UI, the UX has work to be done, as I'm sure. Um, you know, you guys will admit it's not um, 
it's not perfect, but what it is is definitely on the the right track, the inside track. But uh, it's it's going to be, I think, it's going to be demonstrated. This is probably the best way to do it when you've got uh, really fine tuned tools, um, yeah. really usable tools. Uh, this will be, I think, the best model for global payroll going forward. That's 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 very very uh, appreciate appreciate that uh, you know. Um, Vote of confidence and endorsement, uh, for sure. Uh, obviously, we believe in that in that vision that um, global payroll is undergoing a, a a big transformation in terms of the solution landscape, and we're excited part of that. Um, and I think, as you both pointed out, the the underlying idea behind you know what we're what we're trying to offer with Paysar is a kind of a we call it internally kind of a a non-change change agent, right? Um, meaning that without disrupting the things that are actually working, um, which you know, in many organizations, uh, the local payroll relationships, local payroll partners, um, there's actually a lot of lot of really good um, you know capabilities and good um, relationships that have been built. So um, why disrupt those um, and topple the apple cart? With your local payroll um, professionals that you know have come to like that relationship and the trust that they've built, um, when you can bring uh, the benefits that we've been talking about, you know, helping to increase efficiencies, provide better controls, when you can do that without having to rip everything apart. So that's you know obviously the whole whole idea and philosophy behind what we're trying to offer to the market. Uh, in, in Pesar. Um, so finishing up um, the, the, the panel conversation here, um, I'm curious if, if you had to give some advice to other people that maybe are in the same situation that you're in um, or that you were in um, not too long ago when you started your process, uh, what would be maybe a couple of the things that you would, uh, that you would tell people to think about or look at or how to approach this topic? Uh, I think I would say that it's, so yeah, it's key to understand your current processes and your current requirements. As you say, to make sure that you don't disrupt something during implementation um, and to basically make sure that you get the right, um, the right solution. Another really important thing is the kind of expertise that you've got in house. Um, if you already have people with working knowledge of global payroll, people with working knowledge of, of finance systems, then this is going to be a very, very cost effective solution as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, if you, if you need to, if you need to outsource the whole lot, um, and, and you accept the higher cost for it, then the aggregator might be the better choice for you. But obviously, yeah, understanding the tool for the job is key for, for a project like this. Perfect. That makes 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 a lot of sense, Celine. Yeah, a good advice would be plan and look for a phase approach. Um, I think um, moving to a, a centralized payroll, you cannot do a big bang. Um, so make it good planning um, and a good good prioritization of 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 who comes first, etc. And also define the scope of your project. Um, what um, well again we 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 are working in building the shared service center so adding people there and we have to hire I mean all these aspects make it um, and at the same time we also had some vendor switches that was our choice it didn't have to be like that but um, we took the opportunity to do some vendor switches in some countries where we were unhappy with with uh, with the provider we kept of course the ones that we that we loved um so but yeah have a clear view on that um because for those countries or those companies where you would do a vendor switch that will make it slow down the pro the project a bit uh if you decide not to to do any vendor switches then yeah you can you can speed up things a bit more. So, but define a scope. What do you want to take into scope and um, and what not? Uh, mm -hmm. What is your timeline? That would be my advice, yeah. Okay, very good, very good. 
Well, listen, thank you so much um, to, to both of you, Celine and Doug, for sharing your experience and your perspective. Um, I think what we'll do now is we've talked a good amount about the conceptual aspects of the transformation like that. Uh, I'll pass it over now to Ramses to give us a bit of a hands-on view of some of the tools, some of the technology that um, you know, we've kind of touched on and that you are, you know, that are out there. Um, and obviously we'll show you pays our technology in this case, but um, you know, something that you could start to benefit from if you were to go down this kind of journey of a decentralized to centralized payroll transformation. So Ramses, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, I will start sharing my screen to show you a base platform. Let me know, I think. Yeah, we see it. You can see my screen right now. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I will start saying that now that maybe uh, having a decentralized workforce and employee base, uh, um, it's, it's becoming more of a norm now. I think at the right uh, platform uh, 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 will help us to, to, to allow that. And, and in this case, well, I think PayStar is a great solution that will allow decentralization. I'm addressing some of the other challenges that Celine and Doug mentioned today. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of our uh, payroll colleagues have. Um, as you can see, this is space a platform, and we have this is what we call the home screen, where you can see in the first glance that we have different uh, payrolls processes running for my current period. Uh, in this case, we have, uh, for example, this is just, just the demo the information. This is just the uh, information, but I have my Australia pay group, I have my Brazilian pay group, I have a pay group in Germany, a company in Germany. I have a, a service center in Ireland. And with PayStar, we have full control and full visualization of all our payrolls that are running for the current month uh, of the current period. Uh, we, have, we can have control of them. We can see in what stage based on our timeline or in, in our payroll calendar we are right now. Um, we can have control of where, how close we are to the due dates. If you can see, we have as uh, a, uh, 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 a rag status, a uh, uh, red, amber, and green status for all the stages that we have in the payroll, or all the stages that we that we that we run where we have the the, the payroll, and uh, we can visualize when is our pay date, what period are we running, what uh, what is the due date for the current task or the the current process that we're running in in each payroll. And the, the good thing about this is that you can have your different actors and your different users using PACER, and you can restrict the access to certain pay groups, or certain, depending on, on the configuration you made for those users. So it's important to take a look at what uh, we have here. And someone who is, for example, looking into a global payroll and seeing how the, the process is going, uh, this is very useful to see all the things in just one place, all the payrolls running in just one place. Uh, from here, I can start, if I'm a payroll owner, uh, I can start working in my payroll uh, for different stages. Uh, I can review, and it's something I, I'm going to show right now. Um, let me just, I can review my process with my different providers. I can have communication in just one place. Part of that centralization is allowing the communication with our providers in just one place. And, and it's just as easy as connect uh, our providers to a specific pay group. Uh, so we can have, again, different pay groups in different locations, and we can have a different provider in those pay groups. In PESA, you just have to connect your own providers to, to your pay group, and they are ready to go. And uh, also an important thing to mention is that um, it's, PayStar also allows you to standardize your process. So basically you have the same process standardized across your all providers. Uh, and again, coming back to the, to, the, to the process and communication, you will have just one place to communicate with your providers. You will have one place where you can see all your files. You have uh, uh, a centralized uh, document repository 
for all your uh, files that you have in sharing within your providers or with other users inside Pacer. Uh, and you will be able to interact, download those files from just one place. So it comes very handy when you are working with multiple payrolls to have that communication, to have that uh, file uh, repository in just one place without looking uh, some other places uh, for your different processes. Uh, one of the things that um, also allows to see in, in this home screen, uh, well, obviously, is to work with your, your, your different countries, but, but also you can see what are the next actions that you will have to realize in your process or what the pending actions are, are, are meant to happen in your, in your payroll process. Uh, you can see in here you have uh, for Australia, the next action is submit the data. Uh, for example, Germany, we need to approve the payroll. Uh, in, in Ireland, well, we can attach files depending on the stage that we are in the process. Okay. Another thing that there, uh, Celine mentioned that is very important for them in the centralized and standard is the standardization of the reports. Having a global structure on the reports, having a, a consolidated view on the reports is very important to have that central, uh, centralized uh, services. So in PACER, you can look at all your reports uh, in a global way. So it doesn't matter any subject that I, 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 I remember my, uh, Mark mentioned at the beginning that you can have different data sets from your from your local uh, payroll reports, your local gross to nets. And uh, PACER allows that, allows to consolidate all that information in just one place, in just one global currency, uh, in just one language that will allow you to have control of what's happening uh, in, in, in your payroll world, basically. Uh, the way that we can manage to do that is we use the global, uh, we use your local elements from your from your local payroll, and we tag them into a local into a global element that will allow you to review salaries uh, across, uh, for example, review your salaries across your different pay groups. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that comes to comes to me when I was working in Pacer is that. In Australia, for example, we have a superannuation in, 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 in the United States, I think it's called 401k. In Ireland, UK is the pension. And it depends on the provider how they will name that in the local, in the local payroll. But basically by having something like PACER, uh, you can use uh, that and allow to have your all, all of that elements that are called different in different countries. Uh, you can have it under the same uh, category, under the same tag. So it, it, it will facilitate you to visualize and to have control of what you are spending and what you are, uh, what are you, uh, what your payroll cost is in each in in each pay group, but also in the global picture. Uh, also, PACER reporting allows you to not only review globally, you can select for region, for continent, you can select specific uh, entities. So you can uh, review that information in the way that you need it for your purposes. So um, another think, thing we have, tell me. So, so I'm jumping in here because I'm just looking at the time and we're, we're gonna be, okay. yeah. we're gonna be at, at the top of the hour here in a couple of minutes. And I do, do wanna make sure if there are questions from people on the, on the, on the webinar that, that we leave just a couple of minutes here at the end. Um, but I, I appreciate the overview. I think, um, you know, it obviously just scratches the surface um, in the little, little time that we have here, but hopefully it gives people an idea, um, first impression of, you know, what, what a central platform uh, is designed to do. As Ramsey said, it really helps you to have complete visibility of everything that's going on in your payroll in one central place, central task, document, repository, um, data uh, aggregation and reporting environment. Um, so there's lots of, lots of uh, central um, access points to you know, what you would want to see in a shared service environment and how you would want to have your team work in a consistent, um, 
uh, process structure and tool structure in a shared service um, setup. Okay. So let's leave it at that. Um, if there are you know, more questions around the tool and the platform, how it works, obviously we'd be happy to follow up with people um, separately offline. Um, but let's, let's uh, stop here and see if there's any, any additional questions. I know we already answered a few questions as they've come up um, in the Q&A uh, area. So if you do have any questions, feel free to ask them uh, in the Q&A now. Otherwise, if there are no questions, no additional questions coming in, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up for this afternoon. Looks like we we answered everything that um, people people were curious to find out about. Um, so look, thank you again for joining us, um, Celine, Doug. Great to have you on. Thank you again for your um, sharing your insights and your perspective. It was great. Um, and uh, reach out to us if you have additional questions after this webinar. Um, you know this might have triggered some some further thoughts some further ideas some things that you're trying to you know bounce bounce off of someone uh we're happy to answer from our perspective um or put you in touch with some of our clients that um have gone through a similar experience as the ones that celine and doug just described so thank you so much and uh have a great rest of the day everyone thank you Take very care. much thank you. Bye. thank you thank you